Oh, hello. I didn't see you there. I was uh, just rereading my copy of Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel, the Pulitzer Prize winning book uh, about, as you can see, the, the fates of human societies. Um, I know that not all of you are familiar with Diamond's book, but don't worry. Let me try to explain why I, a not-so-humble giver of history talks, think that this particular tome is worthy of discussion here. Diamond's book is extremely popular, uh, and probably the only book on world history that you can find in both introductory history syllabi and in airport bookstores. You may not have read it, but I'm guessing probably that your dad has. Uh, it's sold millions of copies and won all kinds of prestigious awards and been favorably reviewed by everyone from Bill Gates to the New York Times. Um, it is drastically more well-known than any similar book on the subject by an academic or professional historian, and I think that makes it worthy of our attention. Don't... Don't worry if you haven't read the book. Uh, it's quite long, and not all of it is relevant to what we're going to talk about today, but for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to go over the general ideas presented by Diamond and Guns, Germs, and Steel, and I'm going to talk about some of the objections that I and others have with his general thesis. It is my sincere hope that you will find this enlightening and interesting, and that it will encourage you to read more on the subject. Um, if you're watching this during the premiere, uh, I'll be answering questions in the chat as I am able, but feel free to drop a comment down below if you want to know more about something or think I've gotten something wrong. So, let's start with who exactly Jared Diamond is and why we should care what he has to say about anything. Uh, interestingly, Diamond is not a historian or an anthropologist. Uh, he's, in fact, an ornithologist. Uh, and he did his early research on bird evolution in the eastern highlands of New Guinea. Uh, this is where he started to get sort of the inception of the ideas that would eventually come to underlie guns, germs, and steel. Uh, and as he spent a lot of time with the Highland peoples of the area. Uh, one man in particular, uh, a local politician named Yali, asked Diamond a question that stuck with him. Uh, he asked, why is it that you white people developed so much cargo and brought it here to New Guinea and we black people have so little cargo of our own? Diamond finds this to be a pretty compelling question, and his argument for why it needs to be addressed is also fairly well reasoned. Uh, he observes that there are plenty of people in New Guinea that are smarter than the Europeans that he knows, and on the whole, they might well be smarter uh, on average. So it can't be a genetic or biological difference. Uh, Diamond points out that in the absence of a compelling counter-narrative, that people will fall back on outdated and even racist assumptions about the reason for Western or European dominance. To be clear, Diamond presents a sort of a given that the biological explanation is preeminent, uh, but no scholar has seriously presented this idea for uh, the better part of a century at the time of the, the writing of Guns, Germs, and Steel. But I do think he has a good point here. Many people, unless presented with a compelling and easy to understand argument to the contrary, uh, for why these reasons are false, will passively fall victim to imperialist tropes or assumptions. I don't think that people are inher inherently believe racist things, but to the extent that they think about Western domination of the world, it's not wrong to think that they might be susceptible to centuries of propaganda about the justness of imperial conquest that we have only just begin begun to unravel. Uh, the problem is that while Diamond does answer a lot of interesting questions and present some very compelling research in this book, he doesn't really answer the question that he sets out to answer. But before I get to my full criticism, let's let's take a look at what exactly it is that Diamond is saying in Guns, Germs, and Steel. So Diamond begins with um, sort of an overview and eventually um, tries to frame his questions with a chapter called Collision at Calle Marca, uh, referring to the clash between the Spanish conquistador Francisco Pizarro and the Incan Emperor Atahualpa in 1532, which ended with a Spanish victory and the capture of the Incan Emperor. Diamond uses this moment when a, a small number of Spanish troops routed a much larger indigenous force as a framing device for illustrating his thesis about, you guessed it, guns, germs, and steel. He asks four questions about this event, using each of these to elaborate on an element of his argument. His first question is, why did Pizarro capture Atahualpa? Uh, explaining this with one of his signature ideas, namely the presence of gunpowder, steel, and horses on the Spanish side, which gave them a critical advantage in battle. Uh, his second, second question was, why did Atahualpa come to be at Calle Marca? He answers this by pointing out that Atahualpa was involved in a series of civil wars within the Incan Empire. As a result, uh, in part from small, smallpox spreading through the empire. 
Next, Diamond asks how Pizarro came to be at Cayamarca, and why Atahualpa didn't travel to Europe to conquer Spain, for example, uh, which he explains uh, by pointing to the technology maritime and otherwise, uh, and the existence of writing, which allowed Europeans to develop these technologies and implement them. Uh, finally, he asks, why did Atahualpa walk into a trap, which he explains by laying out the literacy of the Spanish Empire and the Spanish in general, and the advantages that the written word provide to people when dealing with new and unexpected situations. Uh, this event and explanation of it, therefore, lays out sort of the the key arguments that Diamonds is trying to make, and it does so fairly succinctly. Now, I'm sure you've already identified some problems with Diamond's explanation of the Spanish conquests, but we'll come back to that. Uh, for now, I'd like to go over the rest of Diamond's arguments. Uh, the second section of Diamond's book is called The Rise and Spread of Food Production, and covers a broad swath of human history and prehistory. Uh, this is, in my opinion, the, the most useful part of Diamond's book, and the most interesting from a historical perspective. Uh, first, Diamond discusses the advantages of, of agriculture in general. Namely, that it allows humans to produce and consume more calories more reliably, and thus develop complex societies, which gives them those, then gives those societies advantages over their less numerous, less dense, and less complex neighbors, uh, which cannot field armies or populations or support populations of tradesmen, bureaucrats, or, or warriors. Uh, as I mentioned in my prehistory lecture, uh, it's an open question whether or not the transition from hunter-gathering to agriculture was a good one, uh, but uh, you can't argue that agriculture doesn't give you a leg up on the competition. To further develop this idea, Diamond then discusses the development of domesticated plants, uh, that is, the plants that uh, we humans selectively bred and developed to become our core crops. Uh, he points out that agriculture developed separately in around nine regions around the, the globe, uh, the Fertile Crescent, China, Ethiopia, the Sahel, West Africa, New Guinea, Eastern North America, Mesoamerica, the Andes, and the Amazon and the similarities that the plants that we all domesticated there uh, tend to have. Namely, these plants need to be suitable for domestication. They need to grow in the right conditions, they need to reach maturity quickly enough to be useful, produce enough edible material uh, to be worth domesticating, not be poisonous, etc. Uh, the plants that become most widely grown and produce the most complex societies tended to be cereal grasses or other grains like wheat, rice, Sorghum, millet, barley, that sort of thing. These grow quickly and easily, produce a lot of calories, uh, and have some protein content, which offsets the, the change from a diverse hunter-gatherer diet to a more sedentary one. Diamond has a lot of interesting examples in this section. For example, uh, wild almonds are quite poisonous, but uh, humans had domesticated them by around 3000 BC because of a, a lucky mutation in almond trees that produces safe and edible nuts. Um, <clears throat> on the other hand, despite humans generally enjoying uh, acorns, the difficulty of growing oak trees and the competition from billions of squirrels spreading their seeds means that we never really successfully domesticated those plants. Diamond's point here is to lay out, at least partially, why some parts of the world developed complex societies so early and others did not. A wheat and rice native to Eurasia, as far as grains go, are easy to domesticate and grow and led to development of cities and states in those regions very early. Uh, Sumpweed and goosefoot, on the other hand, plants native to the Americas, were more difficult to grow or produced less edible material, though they were in other ways superior nutritionally to old world plants. The argument here is not that there is anything uniquely innovative or industrious about the peoples of uh, Europe or Eastern Asia, merely that they had obvious ecological advantages when it came to developing agriculture and therefore uh, complex advanced societies. Diamond expands on this idea with his section on livestock, where he discusses the even narrower band of animal species that humans have been able to domesticate. One consistent behavior of humans across the planet is the keeping of pets, but only a few of these animals have been good candidates for domestication. To be viable domesticates, an animal needs to reach maturity fairly, qu fairly quickly, have the right temperament, be willing and able to breed in captivity, and have a whole host of other specific traits. Uh, for example, humans have often tried to domesticate cheetahs, but their mating behaviors requires a large amount of territory so that the males can chase the females. Uh, and though a domesticated hippopotamus might be useful to a human in all sorts of ways, their habit of biting people in half makes them a poor candidate for domestication. Once again, he compares and contrasts the continents, illustrating the much greater diversity of animals available to Eurasian peoples, dogs, sheep, a sheep, goats, pigs, cows, horses, and more uh, than those available to, say, the Americas, where humans were only ever able to domesticate llamas, alpacas, and dogs. Uh, 
uh, since these animals are useful not only for food production, but for travel and for pulling plows, uh, allowing for deeper and broader agricultural efforts, uh, this only compounds the advantages uh, available to those early civilizations of Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. Diamond's next section brings all of these sort of broad arguments about the ecological and geographical advantages uh, in Eurasia together, starting with the germs part of guns, germs, and steel. In the first chapter, he points out the devastating effect of European diseases on New World societies and discusses why these diseases were so much more virulent than their counterparts across the Atlantic. He argues that the density and variety of domesticated animals of the Old World, namely pigs, chicken, and sheep, and the habits of Eurasian people uh, in, in living in close quarters with these animals uh, meant that varying infectious diseases like measles, smallpox, tuberculosis, influenza especially, were able to make the jump from humans to anim animals to humans more often, creating a much more virulent soup of diseases and microbes in the old world. This is far and away, I think, the part that people retain the most from guns, germs, and steel, so I feel compelled to point out that while this is good and a great survey, uh, Jared, this isn't a Jared Diamond original. He, this idea was borrowed pretty thoroughly from Alfred Crosby's Ecological Imperialism, uh, which I recommend you read if you're interested in this sort of thing. Uh, it goes into greater detail and covers a lot more ground, uh, as well as talking a lot about weeds and other plants that, uh, uh, that helped with this sort of imperial conquest of the New World. The next two chapters deal with inventiveness and writing, and while I think this survey of early writing attempts and the development of technologies across the world is interesting, it feels much weaker than the rest of the book. Uh, and I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail about it. In brief, Diamond argues that a combination of high populations and uh, extensive cultural exchange made technology development deeper and more long-lasting in Eurasia. Again, a, a consequence of uh, geography and ecology rather than anything else. He makes a similar argument for the development of states and complex societies, which allow for large projects like launching ships to travel across the sea and murder millions of indigenous people. Uh, one thing I, I do like about this section is that Diamond categorizes all systems of, gom of governance more complex than simple hunter-gatherer bands as kleptocracies, ways of siphoning wealth from the many to the few. Uh, and the last few chapters are dedicated to the specific discussion of the regions of the world and, and mostly exist to uh, as, a, as a way of demonstrating the validity of, of Diamond's theory of human development. So that's the main thrust of Diamond's argument. And you might, at this point, be asking yourself, well, what's the problem? Well, why so much wailing and gnashing of teeth among historians about this book? Uh, aren't you nerds just jealous that Diamond sold more books than you? Well, yes, uh, there, some of it may be professional jealousy, and allow me to be the first to say that uh, for all of its flaws, this is a well-written book and a compelling read. Uh, the ideas are developed clearly and methodically, and there's a lot of interesting stuff here. Uh, for your first entry into a broad survey of human history, you could do a lot worse. Uh, that being said, this is often the only thing that people read, or they read it and feel satisfied that they've reached the conclusion of the fates of human societies, and close themselves off to further inquiry. Uh, this is just one theory of human development, uh, and in many places it's clear that Jared Diamond developed the theory and then worked backwards to make the evidence fit. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the areas where this book specifically falls short by returning to the collision at Cayamarca. Uh, many of the problems with Diamond's thesis are on display here early. First, Diamond quotes at length accounts from Pizarro's own expedition and presents these accounts as accurate, as truth. Um, I shouldn't have to tell you that reading uncritically the reports of a Spanish conquistador is not a great way to reach an understanding of any historical event. Uh, many historians before me have pointed out the unreliability of these accounts, which were from men trying to tout their own accomplishments to receive additional funding and support from their patrons. A second, Diamond reports, again, entirely credulously, that Pizarro's force of less than 200 men routed an Incan army of 80,000. But even if we believe these numbers, there is evidence that many of these men, if not most of them, were unarmed retainers and not warriors at all. A third, Diamond treats this outcome as a foregone conclusion, right? A result of the geographical advantages uh, granted to the Spanish by the where they just happened to be on the planet. Uh, but Pizarro and Cortez were just two well-publicized successes. There were many other expeditions that ended in failure and defeat for the Spanish. Uh, furthermore, resistance didn't end at Cayamarca, and the conquest of the Americas wasn't 
really ever finished. And uh, in the places where they did technically have control, it was all this. Uh, the Spanish control was always tenuous. Uh, some Mayan city states in the Yucatan, for example, held out until nearly 1700. And this is relatively well known by now, but uh, other scholars have demonstrated again and again that most of the fighting done in the conquest of both the Incas and the Aztecs was done by native allies, uh, some of whom joined forces with the Spanish to overthrow uh, their conquerors. And finally, and to me this is perhaps the most outrageous thing about this section, is that Diamond argues that Pizarro benefited from belonging to a literate society, but Pizarro was famously illiterate. He didn't know a goddamn thing. He couldn't read. Uh, the idea that somehow the Incans were unprepared to encounter new peoples because they didn't have writing is a clear example of Diamond trying to make events fit into his pat explanation of human development. He also runs into a little bit of trouble with his discussion of virulent diseases. While domesticated, the domesticated animal's explanation for the development of disease is a good theory, it is still just a theory, and one of many. Uh, there are other scholars that disagree with this assessment, pointing out that only two pathogens, uh, maybe influenza and, influenza and most likely measles, that he identifies could have possibly jumped to humans through domestication. Uh, the majority were already a part of the human disease load before the origin of agriculture, domestication, and sedentary population centers. Furthermore, he presents the massive depopulation of the Americas as an inevitable consequence of disease, of diseases. But uh, these deaths took hundreds of years and were often a result of European practices post-contact. Um, mass resettlement into compact and unsanitary reduction towns, uh, disruption and destruction of traditional foodways, abuse of forced labor in mines and hacienda plantations, and other factors like, uh, as you can see, uh, the giving of uh, smallpox blankets, uh, all enabled diseases to assault an already weakened populace. So about that cargo that Yaliax asks about, uh, it's a good question, and I think Diamond tried to answer it, but in his attempt to find a rational explanation, he misses the obvious. White people have more cargo because they came and took it. Uh, New Guinea was colonized and exploited repeatedly by various European powers, and despite the obvious advantages that massive expropriation of wealth gave the West, Diamond never once uses the words imperialism or colonialism, and barely mentions capitalism and guns, germs, and steel, which to me, seems like a little bit of an oversight. And while it is interesting and important to ask why technologies developed in countries as a, in some countries as opposed to others, I think it overlooks a fundamental issue, the inequality within countries as well as between them. Um, I assure you that logging industry executives in New Guinea live better than you or I do. In actuality, the development of the world was not all that unequal, and parts of the world had higher living standards and overall wealth than Europe, uh, into the 19th century. And when Europe did begin to exceed the rest of the world within Europe, it was quite uneven and a consequence often of violent exploitation or in the case of, for example, extensive coal seams in England, sheer dumb luck. Mesoamericans, for example, had writing, metallurgy, vast networks of roads, aqueducts and canals, wheels, domesticated animals, and other advanced elements of technology. Uh, and if anything, to historians, the similarities between human societies are much more interesting than the differences. One thing that, that I often come back to when I'm thinking about comparing societies is hygiene. Uh, many, maybe even most societies that Europeans encountered as they were traversing about the globe uh, were more hygienic than they were, from the Aztecs to the Japanese, and uh, many contemporaries wrote about how the Europeans never bathed, they smelled bad, and were generally filthy. Uh, we would consider hygiene to be a virtue and a, a European one at that, but it was not so for much of Western history. Uh, this is just one example of sort of the uneven nature of progress, but there are many others, and I think this illustrates the difficulty with this kind of comparative history. <clears throat> it's worth noting now, at the end, uh, that the guns and steel part of guns, germs, and steel uh, is substantially less useful and informative than the germs part, which, again, is borrowed wholesale from Crosby. Not to be uncharitable, but it feels at times like diamonds came up with a snappy title and then worked backwards. Germs receives their own robust chapter, but guns and steel are sort of packed together into a thorough, less thorough and less interesting chapter on just technology. Uh, and rightfully so, because uh, in the canonical example of Cayamarca, the muskets employed by the Spanish were almost useful, and the Americans, when they had a chance, quickly developed weapons and technology to counter the limited advantages that steel arms and armor provided. <clears throat> 
Diamond's book has long been championed by the kind of people that you might find on the passenger manifest of Jeffrey Epstein's private jet. Uh, Bill Gates, Steven Pinker, Thomas Friedman, you know the type. Ostensibly smart people who are nevertheless invested in the status quo and feel compelled to defend our present circumstances uh, as not just the inevitable end of history, but a, a good and just outcome of centuries of upward progress. I would argue that this book is popular because it justifies Western domination of the world without questioning it or challenging the premise. If the conquest of the Americas was an inevitable outcome of ecological and geographical circumstance, then we don't have to feel bad about the wholesale depopulation and exploitation of the rest of the world by the West. It was just bound to happen. But this makes a lot of assumptions about the course of human history and human behavior and completely removes the element of human agency. We are expected to accept that a more advanced society will inevitably seek to conquer, conquer their less advanced neighbors. Uh, Diamond uses the example of the Maori invasion of the Chatham Islands as proof of this theorem. But to do so requires the will, intent, and desire to do so. Uh, there are also plenty of counterexamples where theoretically less complex societies invade and defeat denser or more complex ones. Uh, the Danish invasion of England, the Mongol conquest of Asia, but Diamond dismisses these as exceptions that do not challenge his underlying premise. It is true that historians tend to steer away from talking comparatively about societies and that questions like Yali's make us uncomfortable, but that's at least in part because being honest about the answers to these questions sounds, makes us sound like radicals. Uh, there's no easy way to talk about the vast inequalities between and within societies without acknowledging the bloody and exploitative history of imperialism and capitalism and the systems like slavery, resource exp expropriation, and scientific racism that have supported it. And in the end, history is a sample size of one, and I can point to dozens if not hundreds of moments where history might have gone radically differently if one person had made a slightly different decision, or one society had moved in a different direction, or if certain events had happened at just slightly different times. Uh, might it, it might be true that if you ran the simulation of human history hundreds and hundreds of times or thousands of times, the outcome would result in Western domination more often than not. But even if that's true, in the absence of such uh, being able to run such a complex simulation and being able to isolate history as an experiment, it's not really defensible to assert this outcome as an inevitable circumstance. I hope you've enjoyed this talk, uh, and if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them, but if there's one thing that I'd like you to do, I'd like you to take away from this, it's a desire to keep questioning. I don't think Jared Diamond is a racist or a bad person, but this book is dangerous because it sanitizes an unjust and unequal status quo, whether that was his intention or not. History is complicated, yes, and of course we want simple answers, but understanding the past means rejecting tidy explanations and embracing the vastness of human experience. Thank you.